us the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In the Lord shall my soul be praised. Let the meek hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name to Around the 14th and 16th centuries, around that time, you, you start to see this movement towards a, a, a reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, people like Martin Luther, they, they break away uh, from the Roman Catholic Church to, to create this church that supposedly, as they, as they claim, uh, returns to its roots hmm. of, uh, uh, of scriptural, uh, a scriptural foundation. Um, I'm not sure how to describe it. Um, and from from then on, we see all these different churches. How are you any different from any of these churches? Because because from what I understand, the way what they claim that that they've returned to this pure Christianity, this this um, uh, where, where they had the Bible and and that's all they've needed, mm -hmm. and they've done away with all the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, like like uh, for example, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. They don't they don't believe in that. Um, what are some key differences between orthodoxy and Protestantism? Uh, well, one of the things that we like to say is we're not non-denominational. We're pre-denominational. Um, it, it is interesting um, that people like Martin Luther, for instance, charged the, the Roman Catholic Church with having created a lot of corruption and added to the original faith, something that they saw as, as an aberration, something that they wanted to get rid of. And so they began what they called a, re a restoration or a reformation of the church. Um, the problem today is that uh, they began to use what individual people, whether and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, John Calvin, Martin Luther, Swingley, it doesn't matter who you're talking about. There are a myriad of interpretations of, well, what is the common root of the church? Or how do you go about reforming it? And so today you have well over 20,000 different Protestant denominations. There can't be 20,000 different roots to the church or, or, or reformed churches. Um, so one of the key differences would be that in orthodoxy we do not believe that we are here to straighten the church out. We believe that the church is here to straighten us out. And if we are to believe our Lord Jesus Christ when he said that he has founded his church uh, upon him as its head, and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. In other words, that it will be here since that time until the end of the world. If we believe that, then it's impossible to believe that the church was ever corrupted to the point where men would have to reform it. Um, that's impossible. Men cannot start their own church. Only Christ is the head of the church and began his church. There is no other beginning to the church. So um, it's, it is very interesting, and it... And it and, Actually, a lot of the Lutheran uh, scholars actually began to converse with the Eastern Church um, and, uh, and were in no way, shape, or form willing to return back to what we would consider orthodox belief or belief uh, the same way that it was practiced uh, prior to um, the Great Schism or, or anything like that. The Protestant churches uh, seem to base their, their creating and um, evangelizing and almost everything solely on, on the foundation of the Bible. Yes. Um, I believe that has, there's a term for that. What is yes, they're, 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 one of their 
uh, one of Martin Luther's founding principles was what he called sola scriptura, which is Latin for only the scriptures. What's wrong with that? Well, you have to ask yourself a very simple question. What scriptures? Now, I'll give you a for instance. Uh, the church, up until the time of Martin Luther, had used uh, for the Old Testament what we call the Septuagint, okay, which was a Greek tra uh, translation or a Greek um, uh, version or edition, if you will, of the Old Testament. This was... Uh, this had come about even before the time of Christ, um, after the conquest of, uh, of the Greeks uh, with Alexander the Great and conquering the known world and having everyone speak Greek. So when you, for instance, if you read the New Testament, which is written in Greek, um, and you see someone like, say, St. Paul or, or St. Peter or any, any one of these people, quote, or even our Lord Jesus Christ, quoting Scripture, they are quoting from the Septuagint. If you fast forward to the days of Martin Luther, he wanted to um, translate the Bible into different languages, for instance, German, which, which he was trying to translate it into. And he decided to choose a different text of the Old Testament to translate. He used the Masoretic text, which wasn't uh, codified until after the time of Christ. And it contains less books in it than the Septuagint. So we're not even talking about, you know, when they say sola scriptura, they're not even talking about the same set of scriptures that they started out with. Um, and then the other, the other aspect of that is, prior um, to the, the complete um, New Testament being written, written which took, might as well round it up to write it about 100 years after the time of Christ. Um, whenever, say, for instance, St. Paul refers to the scriptures in his writings, he's talking about the Old Testament, not the New Testament. The, two, the New Testament really uh, was not held to the same level as the Old Testament for quite some time. It took many, many years before people really started to say, well, we need to put these things on the same level and keep them uh, with the same sacredness as the Old Testament. You're talking about the New Testament. Right, I'm talking about the New Testament. Um, so, and, and, and to that end, we didn't even have something that you could put between two covers and call the Bible until the Council of Carthage in 497. So that's all, uh, excuse me, 397. So that's almost 400 years of the church existing without a universally accepted thing called the Bible. You might go to one area uh, of the Roman Empire and find people using some scriptures and not others. You might go to another area and, uh, and people were using other scriptures. Now, obviously, most of it would be very much in common. Um, but it wasn't universal. So the question that the Protestants would have to tackle is, if they say only the scriptures, which scriptures do you mean? And then if you mean the Bible as they have it today, that wasn't codified till almost 400 years after the time of Christ. So where did the people who codified it get that authority? That was actually my next question. If you're, you're saying that uh, historically there wasn't really a quote-unquote Bible until around the third or fourth century. Yes. Well, then how did the Christians, how, how did Christians uh, worship God? How did, how did they believe what they believed? <clears throat> well, obviously they did have the Old Testament. They had right. the Septuagint. Right. And then um, from the historical documents uh, um, that, that we have, I mean, what the practice of, of Christians were in the earlier centuries is well documented. You know, I mean, you can read it in, in some of the great histories that have been written um, uh, for instance, one of the historians, I think it was Philo, I could be wrong, uh, he says that he's, he's a Jewish um, historian, and he's writing about what Christians are doing, just as a, as a historian. And he says, okay, well, they get together, they read from the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament, and then they read from the, what he calls the memoirs of the apostles. And he's talking about the Gospels. 
Um, and then they would sometimes read letters from St. Paul or maybe even St. Clement. For instance, the letters of St. Clement were widely read, but they are not in the New Testament as we have it today. Who is St. Clement? He was one of the early uh, bishops of Rome. Okay. So you see, I mean, in other words, you might go to a certain place and they're reading the letters of St. Clement in church as if they were scripture. And then you go to another place and they're not reading um, the revelation of St. John's, the book of Revelations. Because they say, oh, that's not, that's not part of the scriptures as we see it. So you really didn't have that settled for a long time. But um, that's be- the, the way that they got, uh, the way that they existed, as, you, as your question goes, is that there wasn't a belief that the scriptures stood alone. The scriptures were part, a very huge part, but they were part of the church's holy tradition. And, and, you know, probably the best uh, testament to that um, is when we see uh, in, the, in the book of Acts where the uh, Ethiopian eunuch is reading um, the, the Holy Scriptures of Isaiah and the apostle walks up and he says, oh, well, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, how can I unless some man explains it to me? So from very early on, the guidance of the apostles and their successors was integral into understanding and applying the scriptures. The scriptures could not stand alone. And I think it's testament that we have so many different Protestant denominations, so many different interpretations of the exact same scriptures that, that goes to point to the fact that if, you, if that's all you take is the, is the Bible and you don't bring any of the context with it, you can come out with... Uh, thousands of different uh, of different conclusions. Right, but I've heard Protestants quote the Bible, um, specifically Second uh, Timothy uh, chapter three, verse sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Right, which again, that was written by Saint Paul, and when he's writing that, the only Scriptures in existence, as they would as they would have understood that. Or the Old Testament. Couldn't he have been sort of writing prophetically? It's possible, but we don't have any evidence that... In other words, no one sat down, including St. Paul. I mean, St. Paul wrote letters to people. He wrote letters to this church, letters to that church. There is no evidence that he ever sat down and said, Okay, I am pinning these books of the New Testament, which will be put together with four Gospels and letters of other apostles like Peter and John, and then that will comprise what, we're, what we are going to call the New Testament. There is no evidence of that. To summarize, um, one of the, it, it seems that one of the key differences between Protestantism and, and the Orthodoxy is that you don't hold sola scriptura. You, no. You don't hold that. Um, what do you hold then? I mean, I mean uh, do you, is, is the Bible in, not as important as the Bible? I mean, oh, no, it, it, far from it. The Bible is hugely important. But the Bible does not stand all alone by itself. In other words, we do not believe that the Bible was written uh, or, or can be used as if... In other words, sola scriptura, when you pursue it to its logical ends, means that you could take the Bible right. and go sit on a deserted island by yourself and work out your own salvation with no help and no context or no guidance from anything else. Um, Whereas we believe that the Holy Scriptures um, are very much intertwined with the church, but it is the church, as St. Paul himself says, um, to to St. Timothy, for instance, where he says that it is the church that is the pillar and ground of truth, not the Scriptures. He doesn't say that. So you have to have both. In other words, it's not, um, it's not either or, it's both and. Uh, we have to have the scriptures and the church uh, to function properly. I mean, in other words, if, that, if, if only the scriptures were important, then my basic question would be, then why didn't our Lord Jesus Christ just write them himself? He was here for 33 years, more than enough time to compose the New Testament by himself. Why didn't he just, before he ascended into heaven, hand the apostles 
a, a, a brand spanking new copy of the King James Version and say, here you go, this is all you guys need. In fact, we have no evidence that Christ ever wrote anything. He left behind uh, his apostles, his followers. And um, for it, definitely the first few um, decades after the time of Christ, all of Christianity was carried about with oral tradition, not written tradition. It was all done orally. Um, and it was sort of, you know, as these apostles start dying out, that people start saying, well, we should, we should really write all of this down uh, and, and, and because, so we don't lose these memories or these things that they told us that Christ said and did. Uh, and so that's sort of where it comes about. But in other words, there is no indication when one looks at it objectively that from the very beginning Christianity was meant to be a, uh, a religion guided by texts. It was a religion guided by the, uh, by the church, by the apostles, by the living. I mean, how, how do you explain this then? How, how do you explain this, this, these different Protestant churches? They, they, they all have the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, they all claim the Holy Spirit is, is guiding them and interpreting these, these, um, the, the, the scriptures, uh, the, the Bible. Um, why are there so many of them, according to the Orthodox understanding? Well, the Orthodox understanding would be that they're not all guided by the Holy Spirit. I mean, if the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and as the scriptures tell us, God is unchanging. And he is, and it is the spirit of truth, which Christ calls the Holy Spirit several times um, the spirit of truth. If that is the case, then the Holy Spirit can't reveal to me A, and then come and reveal to you B about the same scriptures. That's impossible. We're either both wrong, or at least one of us is wrong, okay? But we both can't be... Uh, receiving the same uh, the same Holy Spirit telling us two different things. Um, so I think a lot of the, the a lot of Protestantism is the result of human beings applying their own uh, filters into things. And really and truthfully, you can't you can't approach the Protestant Reformation without also taking into account that this is the time of the Renaissance. This is the rise of humanism. This is the rise of the uh, person coming into his own and thinking, I am capable of interpreting Scripture. Really and truthfully, in my opinion, Protestantism is the replacement of the Bishop of Rome with being your own pope. Instead of having one pope, we have millions of popes. Well, no one would ever claim that, though. I mean, that's, no. that's not what they say. I but here's the thing, the, the, the Protestants, uh, the, the Lutherans say they're right, the, the Baptists say they're right, the Methodists say they're right, Roman Catholics say they're right, you're saying orthodoxy is right, but, but, but how do you make that claim? How? Well, the, unique, the uniqueness of the orthodox position is, is that we can point to our beliefs or our views or what have, however you want to term it, our tradition, we can point to that going all the way back in history. We can say, well, this is the way that it, is, that it has been believed or practiced or whatever, you, or whatever you're talking about. This is the way that it's been. And it's not because we say that now, but because we're, we're relying on the history of things. If you go back and back and back, if you read the writings of the Holy Fathers from the earliest times in Christianity, those are still the beliefs that we hold today. Those are still the people that we read and use them as our, okay, well, how do we understand how to be Christians? We look to the Holy Fathers. Well, the Holy Fathers were there at the very beginning. They were the, you know, spiritual children and grandchildren of the apostles. Um, and so they revealed to us, okay, this is what Christianity is, and it can't change. If God is unchanging, then our faith cannot change. And so we are holding to that which was delivered to the apostles once and for all, we're not trying to add to it. We're not trying to take away from it. We don't shy away from the traditions of the church. You know, in other words, we are relying on what has already been set forth. That's the reason why we're called the Orthodox Church, that which has already been established. You can't, if you're a, a, a Southern Baptist, 
you can't go back in time and go to uh, you know the Roman Empire in the third century and find Southern Baptists doing what you do uh, on a Sunday. They might think what you do on a Sunday is nice and it's you know it's 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 wonderful in many ways, but then they would say, well, where's where's the priest? Where are the icons? Where where is the holy body and blood of our Lord and Jesus Christ? Where are the things that we recognize as being part of the church? They wouldn't find them there. 